نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اهلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم اني اسالك علما نافعا رزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا امين ثم امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته ورس نمبر 50 وَإِذْ فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرَ فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ وَأَغْرَقْنَا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ And recall when we parted the sea for you and saved you and drowned the people of Pharaoh while you were looking on. So now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to narrating the story of the people of Bani Israel and the Pharaoh. What happened actually was that after these, the people of Bani Israel, they were put to punishment and trial. Then seeing the miserable and the plightful condition of Bani Israel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mercy on them. Seeing the misery and the plight of Bani Israel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the merciful, he blessed them with the prophethood of musa alaihi salam and then musa alaihi salam he revived the teachings of the previous prophets in the books he invited them towards the message of allah he taught them to return to the obedience of allah and his commandments which they had abandoned and the people of bani israel they had faith in hazrat musa alaihi salam and they accepted the prophethood of musa alaihi salam and they embraced islam but the arrogant and the cruel kipti nation and their kings they refused to have faith and belief now finally what happened was that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered hazrat musa alaihi salam to finally migrate from egypt along with his companions along with the followers of bani israel and allah ordered them to migrate from egypt on one night and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also ordered them to move out of egypt during the night with total secrecy because of obvious reasons you know because if the rulers had found out and the masters of the slaves would have found out that the slave nation is going to flee and they're going to escape overnight they would not they would not have let them do so so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered hazrat musa alaihi salam to ask the bani israel to accompany hazrat musa alaihi salam and leave egypt overnight and do that with total secrecy has a musa alaihi salam passed on the orders of allah to his followers and his companions and you know what happened when israel obeyed the order of allah how difficult it must have been to pass on this message they did not have these mobiles and the social media of today that with one click we can pass on the message to thousands of people no how did they manage and how did they conduct out and carry out their migration with total secrecy so how did they obey in a state of total obedience overnight total secrecy total discipline the order was obeyed overnight silently hundreds and thousands of obedient people of bani israel they migrated with hazrat musa alaihi salam and remember when they turned to obedience in discipline they turned to obedience 
then the promises of Allah were completed with them. There's no doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps those who are patient, who are steadfast in the obedience of Allah. Now, when they moved out overnight, and in the morning when the people of their masters and the rulers, they found out, then they were followed. And they were followed and they were, they pursued them. And when the people of Bani Israel, they reached the bank of the river and they were followed by the armies of Pharaoh. So ahead of them was the river and behind them was the army. So they would either, they would drown or they would be caught and killed. <coughs> now in this state of affairs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Hazrat Musa alayhi salam to strike the bank of the river with his stick. Now, did does this seem as a practical solution to the problem or the state of affairs? Just think, this in no way, in no way did this seem as a practical solution to the solution, to the problem or the crisis they were facing. But this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was ordering Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. And his obedience was desired. So Hazrat Musa alayhi salam obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although it was not looking like or it was not seeming like a practical solution to the problem, but he obeyed. And when he obeyed, what happened? The help of Allah, the support of Allah, the guidance of Allah, the mercy of Allah joined all of them. How were the obedient followers and the prophet they were helped by Allah was with a miracle. The river parted. When Hazrat Musa alayhi salam struck the river bank with the stick as ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the river parted. And the water in the center cleared up. And there was a clean road. There was a clear route. And the water on either sides, it it was held up as high mountains on, on either sides of the pathway. As a Musa alayhi salam and the followers, they walked through safely. They crossed the river safely, walking through the road which had been created as a miracle for the patient followers. And you know what happened next? Has a Musa alayhi salam when reached the other side of the river, has a Musa alayhi salam tried to do what we all would have done if he had been in that position. He tried to strike the stick on the river, thinking that by striking the stick on the other bank of the river, the, the river will reunite and the passage will close and this will stop the army on the other bank and we will be saved. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah stopped Hazrat Musa salam, from striking the river bank. Resisting to do this was difficult. Resisting to stop doing this must have been really difficult. But that is what Hazrat Musa salam, did. When he was asked to do something, he did that. When he was stopped, there was a don't of Allah, then he stopped. This is the role model of the prophets for all of us. And what did he gain out of it? What happened? What happened was that when the Pharaoh and his army, they started to walk along the route, along the road in the river, then by the order of Allah, the river reunited and all of them were drowned by the order of Allah. This is Allah. And this is his support and help and guidance and mercy, which he showers and bestows on whom? Those who are steadfast, those who are patient in the obedience of Allah. Now, what messages do we gather from this verse are, number one, Allah punishes the disobedience. All those who are disobedient, Allah punishes them. Number two, the hardships in the life may be the punishments of Allah. Number three, Allah rewards and helps and supports and guides and, and, and 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses all those who are obedient to him, all those who are patient and steadfast in his obedience. Number four, to escape from the trials and hardships of life, people need to do what? They need to repent. They need to change their disobedience and replace it by the obedience of Allah. The fifth point is the do's and don'ts of Allah. However difficult to obey, but when they are obeyed, then they lead to the help and support and protection and blessings of Allah. The sixth point which I gather from here is that if the orders, the do's and don'ts of Allah in certain conditions, they do not seem to be practical. They do not seem to be na'uzubillah rational to the human mind. But remember he is al-Hakim. Remember he is al-Alim. However unpractical, however impossible they may seem, but those who seem to cling to obedience are always those who are successful here and hereafter. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Verse number 51 to 54, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa is wa'adna. وَإِذْ وَعَدْنَا مُوسَى أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً ثُمَّ اتَّخَذْتُمُ الْعِجْلَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ وَأَنْتُمْ ظَالِمُونَ And recall, and recall when, when we made an appointment with Musa alayhi salam for 40 nights, then you took for worship the calf after him while you were the wrongdoers. Then we forgave you after that, so perhaps you will be grateful. And recall when we gave Musa alayhi salam the scripture and the criterion that perhaps you will be guided. And recall when Musa alayhi salam said to his people, oh my people, indeed you have wronged yourselves by your taking of the calf for worship. So do what? So repent to your creator and kill yourselves. That is the best for all of you in the sight of your creator. Then he accepted your repentance. Indeed, he is accepting of repentance, the merciful. Innahu huwattawabur rahim. So now I will be talking and explaining the next four verses from verse number 51 to verse number 54. In these four verses is narrated the next sequence of events. <coughs> now, after saving uh, the Bani Israel from the tyranny and the slavery of the Pharaoh and the very cruel Kipti nation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them freedom and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got them settled in the desert and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Hazrat Musa alayhi salam to come up for his meetings because uh, he was to be given the commandments for his people and that is what Allah is saying here we made an appointment with Musa alayhi salam for 40 nights and um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after their uh, liberation and freeing them up from slavery and providing them with a, with, a, with a separate land for themselves, Allah was now wanting to give them commandments in which they were supposed to act according to that in their lives. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, according to the order of Allah, he left his people in the desert to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Mount of Thur. Now, what happened after him? is which Allah is mentioning here, then you took for worship the calf after him when you were the wrongdoers. Now, how did they start worshiping the calf? And what was the whole episode? You know, what happened was that when the night 
the night when they were uh, leaving Egypt and they were migrating, what the women folk did was that they, they picked up all their jewelries because the love of gold, women with the love of gold and the love of gold has there been in all, all periods, in all times. So the women folk, they carried all their gold and all their jewelries and they brought them along with them, all their gold and jewelries. But when they reached the desert, all this gold and all the jewelry, it started seeming worthless. And it started seeming to them, it was very worthless and useless. So what they all did was that they dumped all their jewelries in gold and it heaped up. Now there was a person which Quran mentioned as Samri. Quran has been mentioned, has mentioned about Samri. Samri was a person who had migrated along with Bani Israel. And he was somehow the religious and the religious and the political opponent of Hazrat Musa salam. And by trade, he was a goldsmith and he was also a magician. So he very cleverly, he gathered all the gold. And since he was a goldsmith, he melted the gold. And from the molten gold, he made the model of a calf. And he made the mouth of a calf. He was very clever and he was very expert in his skill. He made the mouth of a calf in a manner that when air would pass through the mouth, it would make a sound similar to the sound of a calf. You, you, you must have seen the toys of children, the rubber toys when you press them and the air goes out of the whistle, it makes a sound. So similarly, some sort of a thing. So he made a golden calf with a queer sort of a sound coming from the mouth also. And he presented it to the people of Bani Israel after Hazrat Musa alayhi salam had left. So when they saw the people of Bani Israel, when they saw this miracle golden calf, they took it as their God. And they started worshiping this miracle calf, miracle golden calf. Now, why did they worship this calf was because, you know, the people of Egypt, their masters, their rulers, the Kipti nation, they, in their polytheism, they used to worship the cow. So out of uh, being impressed directly or indirectly being impressed by their rulers and by their masters, when in Egypt, they used to worship the calf also. So when this calf, which had basically like two love factors, one was the love of gold and one was the regard of the calf. So if this, if the calf was presented in this impressive and, and a very loving manner, so they uh, started worshiping this calf. Although they had been blessed with freedom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ensured and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had protected them and now had blessed them with freedom. But you know what? This freedom which they had acquired was just a, a physical or I can say a geographical sort of a freedom. But actually, mentally and socially, they were still a slave nation. They were still in a slave of mental and a social slavery. In fact, even a religious slavery. And they had not still come out of idolizing and following their masters. And so in this state of social and mental and even a state of religious slavery, they started worshiping the golden calf. Now there during his meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam was informed about the act the act of this polytheism by his followers. So Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, the whole story is narrated in other surahs and chapters of Quran and I'm explaining it here because we will be able to elaborate these verses more clearly also. And then Hazrat Musa alayhi salam in a state of anger and fury, he returned and he questioned first of all his brother and then his followers and he was very really aggressively asking them and he was very aggressive in his accountability and finally 
he he also asked and he addressed summary and this debate inshallah we will be talking about in surah Taha and surah qasas and surah shura in detail but finally Hazrat Musa alayhi salam ordered that the golden calf should be burnt and he ordered that the ashes would be blown in air and they would be thrown in the flowing river as Allah says in Quran that as Musa alayhi salam said that they burnt the they burnt the golden calf to ashes and the ashes were then blown over in the air and they were thrown in the river to be flown away this means what this was the step of eradication of polities so we understand that how strict and how harshly we need to eradicate any form of polytheism in the society. And then Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, he turned towards his people and uh, what he did after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he addressed his people. <coughs> he turned towards the people and asked them to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the act of polytheism and for their worshiping the golden, uh, the golden calf. And uh, because of, uh, because of all the sin of polytheism they had committed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he asked them to seek forgiveness. But how would, how would they expected to seek forgiveness for polytheism was very different from how the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu seeks forgiveness. Because you know, the people of Bani Israel, they were a group of very obstinate and stubborn, disobedient people. And because of this obstinacy and because of this stubborn disobedience, the orders which were given to Bani Israel, they were also much, much more strict as compared to the orders given to the Prophet Sallallahu followers. For example, in our religion, we, for forgiveness, for forgiveness in the followers of Prophet Sallallahu what do we need to do? We just need to accept what we did wrong and we just need to, in a state of regret, in a state of regret, after accepting and confessing our wrong do, deeds or sins, and regretting all what we need to do is we just need to utter the words of repentance. And this is all what we need for seeking forgiveness. Astaghfirullah Rabbi, or elaborating even more, Astaghfirullah Rabbi bin kulli zambin batu bole. Or verses like Rabbi khfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin. Oh Allah, have mercy on us and forgive us because you are the most merciful. But for the people of Bani Israel to seek forgiveness from polytheism and worshipping anybody else other than Allah. So for seeking forgiveness from this, they were supposed to kill the people who had worshipped any being other than Allah. So the calf was burnt and the people who had worshipped the calf, they were killed by those who had not worshipped the calf. And so their punishment was very strict. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning here in this verse. So uh, what we learn from this verse is that the verse shows that how, how disliked worshipping beings other than Allah is and how disliked polytheism is in the, Allah, in the eyes of Allah. And the verses also eradicate also highlight how important it is to eradicate any forms of worships Allah the, other than Allah and how should how firmly and how harshly and how strictly should all forms of polytheism be eradicated from the society or families or nations now coming to verse 55 and verse 56 
and recall when you said, oh, Musa alayhi salam, we will never believe you until we see Allah outright. So the thunderbolt took you while you were looking on. And then we revived you after your death that perhaps you will be grateful. So now in these two verses, Allah is explaining the sequence of events which took place after the previous story. After eradicating the polytheism from the people, burning the, burning the calf and uh, putting Samri to exile and then killing all those who had worshipped the calf by the hands of those who had not worshipped the calves, then Hazrat Musa alayhi salam ordered them to worship one Allah and to accept and to obey the 10 commandments of Allah which had been handed over to Musa alayhi salam during this conversation and the meeting of 40 days. And these 10 commandments of Allah, we will be talking in the chapter number 10, inshallah, in near future. These 10 commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which were issued to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam were written on wooden, on uh, stone slates. Seeing these orders written and engraved on the stone slates, touching the slates with their hands, listening to the words of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, and seeing the slates with, his, with their own eyes, they still refused to obey the orders of Allah. They were obstinate, they were stubborn to their core. And you know what? They entered into an argument with Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. And they said that they would believe in Allah only, only after they hear Allah conversing to them with their own ears. And this demand was put to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam because Hazrat Musa alayhi salam told them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has conversed with me and your creator has talked to me and given me all these commandments. So now you need to believe them and accept them. And obey them. So they said, out of their sheer stubbornness and obstinacy and arrogance, they said, that, okay, fine, we will obey them and we will accept them only if we, if we directly listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ourselves. So with this argument in, uh, when it was set in, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam gathered a team of uh, 70 of the tribe leaders and uh, took them to the Mount of Thur. And then where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conversed with Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, and they heard the conversation with their own ears. But still, even after this miraculous things what they had heard, they still refused. And the demand that hearing was not sufficient, the hearing was not sufficient enough for proof. They needed to see Allah. Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulli zambin wa They demanded that they needed to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their own eyes. This was cross. This was utter stubbornness and obstinacy and disobedience and arrogance. And then they were asked to look at the mountain and a lightning struck and they were all killed. Now seeing the 70 leaders killed, Hazrat Musa Islam got upset as to what will he tell his people and how will he face them? Telling them that the 70 tribes, men, the leaders they, he had took, they're all dead. And, they, and the people would become even more hostile to Hazrat Musa Islam. So he prayed to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to grant them forgiveness and to return them to life. And the supplications of the prophets are heard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted Hazrat Musa's supplication and the tribal heads were again put to life. They were given life. And such a remarkable miracle and a blessing of Allah, but still they refused to accept and have faith and belief and to accept the orders of Allah. So the message is what? The obstinate and the stubborn mannerism of Jews is what was the cause why they were the cursed and the mahdub. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, help us 
stay away from obstinacy and stubbornness and arrogance. Help us, help us have faith. Help us and protect our belief and iman and help us obey the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala readily, willingly, completely. Rabbana, innana, amanna, faghfir lana, zanubana, waqina, azab and nar. Now, verse number 57. The last verse of today's session. وَظَلَّلْنَا عَلَيْكُمُ الْغَمَامَ وَأَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَنَّ وَالسَّلْوَى قُلُوا مِنْ طَيِّبَاتِ مَا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ وَمَا ظَلَمُونَا وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ This verse is explaining the next sequence of events after being blessed with a free land and freedom in the desert they were blessed with these bounties which are being mentioned in this verse. Allah said, and we shaded you with clouds and sent down to you man and salwa and asked you what? Eat from the good things which we have provided you. But they did what? And they wronged us not, but they were only wronging themselves. Now, after narrating the story, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse is explaining that how they were settled in the desert and how they were blessed with so many blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here. Now, with this verse, we, there are many things we need to understand. The first thing which I would want to highlight is that why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala settle them in the desert? Now, after giving them freedom, Allah could have very well, it was very much possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they could have been settled in a rural or an urban population also. So why were they settled in a desert and why was a desert chosen for the settlement of people of Bani Israel? You know what? The people of Bani Israel, after being freed from the clutches of the Pharaoh and the Kiptis, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had now chosen them to be the followers of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. They were now chosen as followers of Musa alayhi salam, as helpers, as supporters of Musa alayhi salam to help him in the implementation of Islam. So they were now, they were now expected to teach, to preach, to spread, to protect, and to implement the teachings of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, that is the teachings of Islam. So they were picked out and they were chosen for this pious deed. And we also know that people who who are the settlers of the desert. They are tough, they are hardy, they are resilient. They are used to a simple life and they are closer to nature. And because of their being close to nature, they, they very readily accept the teachings of Islam as Islam is a nature, is a religion of nature. So to facilitate their mission, facilitate the mission which they were going to be handed over, the mission of the teaching and the preaching and the protection and the implementation of Islam. This mission was going to be handed over to them. They were, they were settled in the desert so that they, they became tough, they became hardy, they became strong, they became resilient, they became close to nature and they became used to a simple manner of life. But once they were settled in the desert, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped them and supported them and blessed them. Blessed them with what? In the desert, the main issue is of the scorching sun and the heat and the unbearably high temperature. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered and there used to be a cloud, a cloud which used to stay in the sky above their settlement and they had shade. 
and there was coolness and they were prevented and they were protected from the scorching sun and the heat of the unbearable heat of the desert so that they were comfortable. And then in the desert, since there is no agriculture, there's no trees, there's no plantation. So food and gathering food becomes an issue. So there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the desert, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said what? Wa anzalna alaykumul manna wa salwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them man and salwa. Man was what? Man was a liquid which used to fall from the sky at night like the dew drops. And they used to use it as what? They used to fill it in containers and uh, then they used to drink it as a very delicious and a very energizing fluid. So it was a delicious energy drink. That is one purpose this man fulfilled. And secondly, we learned that this man as dew drops, it used to fall at night and wherever it used to fall, these drops used to settle down and the drops used to dry. And when these drops used to dry, they used to make small round granules and they used to collect them and they used to grind them and they used to use these grinded granules of man as flour. And they used to use it as a staple food, you know. And uh, salva was like, small little birds, very tiny little birds used to come in flocks. And this used to provide energy and protein and a very delicious source of food for them. Now, the question now arises is that why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provide them with man and salwa? Number one, to set them free from the hassle of earning, to set them free from the hardships of earning and fending and fetching and providing because they had a bigger, they had been assigned a very big mission in their life. They had been given and assigned a very high target in their life. So they could only implement implement Islam if they were freed from all these hassles. So remember, The lesson learned is what? People who want to plan to work for preaching and teaching and implementation of Islam, they would need to leave these worldly commitments and hassles to some extent. Too many worldly involvements and too many worldly commitments and hassles, that will will make dawa and preaching and teaching and spreading the words of Allah, it will make that mission slightly difficult. And next, we also need to understand why always, why always man and salwa? Allah could have given them wearable foods. Allah could have given them wearable dishes. Allah the Razik could have provided them with sometimes pigeons and sometimes one bird and sometimes the other bird meat and sometimes anything else. Wearable foods could have been provided as well. By what, why, why only one option always and always? You know why? To train the team, to train the team with the mission of teaching and preaching simplicity of meal to get them used to simple, easy, convenient eating habits, simple and easy, convenient meals. Remember, all those who indulge in complicated and variable eating habits, it takes up a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of efforts. You know, there are two types of people, people who just eat to live, So this category of people who are just eating to live, who eat to gain energy, to keep themselves going, you just eat for this purpose. And then there are people who just live to eat. The only purpose of living is they want to eat, they want to enjoy. They want to enjoy food and meals. They just live to eat. If the state of affairs is living to eat, then such people will fail to achieve high targets and high missions and goals in life. But for all those, 
for all those whose life is eating, eating and eating, all the time, all the energy and money will be used up for eating. And there will be very less of money and energy and time left for bigger achievements in life, for bigger goals like teaching and preaching of life, of Quran and implementation of Quran, no time and no money and energy would be left. All the time and money and energy will be spent on cooking and baking and preparing and laying down and discussing and learning and collecting just food. So remember, if we want to have higher ambitions, higher targets, we need to simplify our eating habits. And then going again to to the story again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said what? That you can eat and you can drink, but do what? Do not cause corruption in the earth. What was this? When Bani Israel were provided with man and salwa, they were ordered. Was what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them that you will be blessed with man and salwa daily, every day, enough for your needs but they were stopped for doing certain things while consuming this man and salwa. They were stopped for collecting more, taking and collecting more than their own requirement and own share. Take as much as you want, eat as much as you want, and don't collect and gather more than what you need or what you want, number one. Secondly, don't snatch from the weak. Thirdly, they were ordered not to collect and hoard it. But these people of Bani Israel, as we can keep on gathering from the story, they were disobedient, always disobedient. You know what they did here? The people, amongst the people of Bani Israel, the young men, the strong, young, youthful men, they used to do what? they used to snatch and gather the man and salva much, much more and beyond their needs and requirements. And they used to actually snatch the share of the women and the children and the old and the sick, leaving them deprived and leaving them hungry. And when the hungry and the deprived used to ask them, they used to keep on asking and begging, but these hard-hearted, selfish, cruel snatchers, they used to hoard it up and they used to stock it down and they did not allow them to take this food. And the food used to rot and used to go bad. And the next day they used to throw it away. But their selfishness did not allow them to let the hungry eat. So this is what they were stopped and this is how they behaved. And you know why? Why they were stopped to take only their share and not to hold it? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to train them. The preachers, the teachers of the teachings of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, those who were, who were intended to be the protectors and the implementers of the Islam, they were being trained and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to train them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted that they should learn how to be selfless. They should learn sharing and caring. They should, they should learn to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, they should learn reliance on Allah. And they should learn to take out the love of world. And they should be able to scratch out all forms of lust of this world and greediness and selfishness, they should take it out of their mannerism. But they did not, they did not receive the training and they were selfish and they were greedy and they were lustful and they did not share and they did not care and they were hard hearted and they were harsh and they had the love of the world. And moreover, they had no reliance and tawakkul on Allah. So what was desired for their training 
they still were deprived despite receiving the blessings and the bounties of Allah. Their behavior was totally against what they were needed and desired to behave like. And the nation of Bani Israel was a group of disobedient people. They were stubborn, they were obstinate, they were selfish, they were greedy, they were lustful. And then they were punished. Allahumma la taj'alla minhum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us all, protect us all, save us all from stubbornness and obstinacy, from disobedience and transgression, from selfishness and greediness, from lust of money and the lust of the worldly desires. Allah help us to be selfless, to be caring, to be sharing, to be obedient. Rabbana la tuzir qulubana bada is hadaitana wa hablana milatun karwahma innaka antal wahab. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ameen summa bihamdika.